the way the Buddha defines mindfulness, it's a neutral quality. Simply the ability to remember what was done or said a long time ago. What makes it skillful mindfulness or right mindfulness is when you remember the right things, things that are useful. Like we're meditating right now. We're remembering that it's a good thing to stay with the breath. And we remember the different instructions that tell us what we can do with the breath, what we can do with the mind, so we can get the breath and the mind to stay together. Because we're trying to develop a state of concentration. And from the concentration, we want to be able to see the mind clearly to see particularly where it's causing itself unnecessary suffering. Those are all good things to remember. And when we think about good things to remember, there's an interesting linguistic feature of Pali. And another word that refers to remembering what was done or said, katanyo, means gratitude. You think about the things that other people have taught you that were actually useful, that were actually helpful, or the examples they gave in their behavior. They were useful examples to take for how you should behave. You should treat those with gratitude. The more gratitude you have for them, the more likely you are to apply them to so where we're meditating. It's not just a neutral technique. We should have a sense of gratitude for the fact that we have these teachings, we have these instructions. There was someone who a long time ago said or did something that's really useful for us right now. Of course, the sense of gratitude grows as you practice and you begin to see the results. They say that a John Munn, on the night he came to awakening, Right after he gained his awakening, the first thing he did was got up and bowed down to the Buddha again and again and again, out of gratitude. For all those instructions he had left that enabled him to find something of real value inside himself. Until we reach that point, we may not have that intense sense of gratitude. But still, it's good to remind ourselves that it's a good thing we have these teachings. Think of all the difficulties the Buddha went to in order to find, find them, and how precarious it has been sometimes throughout the centuries that these teachings have stayed alive. But there are people who made the effort, all the way down to our teachers. So come to the meditation with a sense of gratitude that it's something you can do. And even before you see the results, you look at the teachings and you realize, the compassion that lies behind them. One of the things we've learned from postmodern theory is the extent to which when people teach you, they're trying to exert power over you. But you look at the Buddha's teachings here, and there's almost nothing of that. It's all, these are things that are going to be useful for you. These are things that are going to help you solve your problems. These are things that are going to show you freedom. It's in pointing out the various ways in which we are free and that we don't usually think of. That's where the teachings are especially valuable. The Buddha starts with generosity, pointing out that it is an act of freedom. In that moment when you're generous, you're free from your greed, you're free from your attachment. You're able to rise above these things. And you get a sense of your worth as a person, that there's a higher level of happiness that comes when you don't simply give in to your appetites, when you see the benefits that come from sharing, and you realize you're free to make that choice. Similarly with the precepts, we're free to choose to behave in ways that are harmless. Now you may have to make sacrifices in order to do so, but you realize that your worth as a person lies in your ability, your freedom to stick with that choice. 
because you're, you're also free to be harmful. If we didn't have freedom, there would be no worth to our actions at all. But because we do have the freedom to be either harmful or harmless, and we choose to be harmless, it gives rise to a justified sense of self-esteem. And here as we meditate, we begin with something very simple, the way you breathe. You're free to breathe in any way you want. The Buddha is simply pointing out that this is a very useful area to explore your freedom. You can try long breathing, short breathing. As John Lee points out, you can try deep, shallow, heavy, light, fast, slow. You can think of the breath in lots of different ways. In fact, you're free in all the types of fabrication you bring to the present moment. There's bodily fabrication of the breath, and verbal fabrication, direct the thought and evaluation. You're free to direct your thoughts anywhere. Well, direct them to the breath, because it's going to be a useful place to direct your thoughts, and evaluate the breath. What kind of breathing is comfortable? What kind of breathing the mind is willing to stay with for long periods of time? When you get a sense of comfort, what do you do with it? You spread it around the body, so that your awareness can fill the body and get a grounding. Then there's mental fabrication, your perceptions and your feelings. You have more room for creating feelings in the body, feelings in the mind, than you might have thought. The present moment is not just a given. The way you breathe, the way you perceive the breath, will have an effect on how you feel it. And so what kind of perceptions can you play with? What kind of perceptions will be most useful? The John Lee talks about the breath channels for the body, the different levels of the breath, the obvious breath that we breathe in, breathe out, the more subtle breath that goes through the breath. Breath channels are on the nerves, around the blood vessels. And then there's the still breath that lies deeper still. These levels of breath energy are all there. In fact, there have been people who teach us about this. We should be both mindful and grateful for those teachings. The more gratitude you bring, as I said, the more likely you are to apply the teachings. The more you get a benefit, benefit from it, the more gratitude you have. So we learn how to explore this area of freedom we have here in the present moment, try to make the most of it. Because the Buddha said there's something else. We're also free not to suffer. It will begin to seem, as we get the mind into concentration, that we're getting pretty close to not suffering at all. But as it happens, you, the more you're used to this level of ease in the mind, the more sensitive you get, the more demanding you get as to what really counts as well-being. You begin to see, even in the various levels of jhana, there's still some stress. As the Buddha points out, we don't have to just stay there and accept that. We can start exploring that. What are you doing to cause the stress? When you find out the perceptions causing the stress, can you change it to another perception that's less stressful? Then you're free to do that. And keep exploring this issue, what you're doing to cause unnecessary stress, until you get to the point where you realize wherever you go in concentration, there's going to be some stress. Is there an alternative? And the Buddha says, yes, there, you are free to find the alternative. This is where the freedom gets more radical, because up to that point you're either staying in one spot or you're moving to another spot. That's the choice you have. But then you realize, either way you're going to encounter stress.
and you find that there's another alternative. And that alternative opens things up in ways that you wouldn't imagine. And that's the real freedom the Buddha is talking about. And so to realize that his intention was to free us. As he said, he dwelled with an unrestricted awareness. And he was teaching other people how to dwell with unrestricted awareness, totally free. So it's good to keep that in mind, to be mindful and grateful at the same time. That there was someone who made the effort and found that this was possible and then made the effort to leave those teachings behind. You read about his 45 years as a teacher, and it wasn't easy. There were a lot of people who put up resistance. And you can imagine the irony he saw in that. He was trying to offer people freedom, and they felt attacked. The proper response, as I say, is gratitude and mindfulness. As the Buddha pointed out, the teacher's duty is to offer protection, and the primary protection he offered was to show us that we do have freedom of choice. The few times he would go out and argue with other teachers were when they denied freedom of choice. Because, as he said, that leaves you unprotected. You don't feel you can do anything at all. You're trapped. Whatever suffering comes up, you're stuck with it. So his first gift is to remind us we do have freedom of choice, and the choices can take us very far. That's his protection. There's another connection in Pali with the word sarana. It can mean both a refuge and something you keep in mind. So here again, you keep in mind what the Buddha taught. You have gratitude for what he taught, and it will provide you with protection. The protection that comes when you know that you're free to choose. You're ultimately going to be free to choose not to suffer at all. Always keep that in mind. 